Well, introductions aside, now we can start our exploration of sensory physiology, that's what you're here for. Um, so, as I said, our lab studies hibernation and we use um, kind of a strange model organism. You know, most people, when you think of labs, they study you know, mice, fruit flies, things like that. But it turns out there's a whole, you know, there's a large biodiversity of animals, and all these animals have adapted very specialized systems that enable them to survive. So you know, here's just an example of some of the animals that have these very advanced uh, sensory systems in one form or another. So by using the naturally occurring biodiversity, um, it gives us a, a better idea of how uh, human physiology works, how human sensory physiology works, and the molecules involved in that. So over the course of this week, you'll see us give a lot of uh, examples from the animal kingdom about different, different um, unusual adaptations. Um, and so uh, get ready for that. So since this is sensory physiology, I figured uh, we'd start off, get everyone on the same page, and just see if we know the five senses. So yell them out. What are the five senses? Hearing. Hearing, one. Tasting. Tasting. Touch. Touch. Seeing. Smell. Seeing, yep. That's all of them. So there they are. Um, today we're going to focus on mostly on somatic sensation, so the, the um, sense of touch and temperature perception. But um, over the next five days, we'll get to all the others as well. So you can see that um, for each of these senses, our bodies have a very uh, specialized organ. So for touch, you, for touch, you have the skin. For taste, you have the, the tongue. For smell, the nose, etc. Um, and so these organs are all very important for detection of the initial stimulus. Uh, but all that information has to be processed somewhere and integrated and allowed us allows us to make a uh, Make sense of what we're what we're feeling. Um, so does anyone know where all this information is integrated? I'm sure you all do. The brain, yeah, exactly. So um, just a quick overview of the brain. The brain is a very complex place. It's a very powerful computer. Um, within just the cortex alone, so this is just the outer layer of the brain. Um, you have areas that are devoted to many different uh, um, processes. So in the back of the brain, you have um, areas devoted to visual system processing, you have areas devoted to auditory processing, you have areas that are specific for um, touch perception, motor control, all these things. So, and within each of these areas, you have uh, individual brain cells called neurons. Neurons, yeah, this guy's good. Um, and so, neurons are, you know, they come in all different shapes and sizes depending on what kind of uh, function they're serving. Um, this is just a very generic neuron. Um, so in general, as you know, it's a cell, so it has a nucleus. Uh, the nucleus contains a genetic material. And the nucleus is uh, found in a, a, a cell structure called the soma, or the cell body. And then branching out from the cell body, you have dendrites. So these little tufts here are dendrites, and this is where uh, you receive inputs from other neurons. And so each, each neuron can receive inputs from hundreds of other cells, so it can be very uh, complex. Um, in addition, a lot of these neurons have one elongated process called an axon, so these can be uh, very, very long. And uh, the axon, and the structure is called axon terminals, and this is where communication extends to the dendrites. Um, and along the length of the axon, oftentimes what you'll have is a, a wrapping called myelin. And this myelin is just a fatty wrapping that allows electricity, electrical impulses to travel more efficiently and faster down the length of that axon, so you can make you know, split second decisions. But of course, the brain is made up of you know, more than just one neuron. So this is just a, a snapshot of what a, a very, very small piece of the brain looks like. Um, you see that you know, each one of these cells can talk to hundreds of others. Uh, and just to give you an idea of how complex the system is, it's been said that there are more synapses within the brain, more connections between neurons, than there are stars in the galaxy. So it's, it's a very uh, complex process and gives you a lot of things to study. So we're not in any, anywhere close to understanding brain in its fullness. Um, at the, at the substructural like level here, um, so this is what's going on in a synapse. So as I said, the synapses are the location of communication between cells. So when one cell becomes activated, it generates an electrical impulse called an action potential. This travels on the length of the axon. Um, when it gets to the axon terminal here, it initiates um, 
vesicle fusion with the membrane. So at the axon terminal, you have these vesicles that are filled with neurotransmitters, these uh, chemical messengers. And when an action potential reaches uh, the, the terminal, these membranes will fuse together and uh, dump the, the contents into the extracellular space. So you have all these neurotransmitters floating through the extracellular space, contacting their receptors on the postsynaptic cell, uh, the, you know, the, the, the cell that's receiving information, and that can elicit an action potential in this cell. So you can have the signal going from here, and then down to the next cell. And that way you can get communication. And this is going on constantly in your brain, all over. Um, but, and, and the, the, the brain in large part is what's responsible for really uh, allowing you to, to uh, integrate all of this information. But there are certain cases when you can uh, initiate a movement independently of the brain. I mean, think of some situation where you might uh, move before you even comprehend that, that you're moving. Reflexes. Yes, reflexes. Exactly. So um, the bodies have evolved, you know, these, these processes called reflexes that enable you to protect yourself before even having to spend the time to think about, you know, hey, I should move. So when you reach, grab a hot, hot pot on the stove, oftentimes your hand will jerk away before you even realize that it's hot. And that's because you have these circuits that go from um, the skin to the spinal cord and back to the muscle, uh, even without going to the brain to, to think about moving. So how do, how do we sense touch and temperature? Uh, at the cellular level, it turns out that your skin is filled with different types of nerve endings. Um, so you have certain neurons that are specialized for uh, detecting light touch, painful touch, um, pleasantly warm or cool temperatures, painfully hot or cold temperatures, um, a whole variety of stimuli, right? And so depending on what sort of stimuli you have, it will activate a specific type of neuron. So for the case of painful heat, you activate neurons called nociceptors that uh, initiate action potentials, send their signal to the spinal cord, and where that information can then be uh, transmitted to a, a second neuron that then goes to the, the brain for further processing. At the same time, you have another neuron here um, that will transmit a, an action potential to the, the muscle and initiate contraction so that you can retract your hand from that burning stimulus. Uh, and so, you know, we, we often think about pain as being unpleasant, right? You know, it would be nice if you could just get rid of pain, but it turns out actually that pain is very important. Um, it plays a very protective role. Uh, there are certain minority of people that are born without the ability to sense pain. And it's, it's really uh, an awful condition because if, if you can imagine these kids, they don't know that you know, I shouldn't put my hand in a, a pot of boiling water. And they'll put their hand in without knowing um, and burn their, their skin off. Or they'll fall off the monkey bars, break their arms, run around like that can happen. So they have uh, a lot of problems really understanding uh, how to protect themselves. Uh, so oftentimes pain is protective. But, uh, I guess we'll you know, pass something around. So it turns out that there are a number of plants in particular that kind of take advantage of this weakness of ours and have developed compounds in order to protect themselves from uh, herbivores, omnivores, from, from being eaten, essentially. So this is mint. So this is a mint plant. Um, mint tree. So take a leaf and chew it. Yeah. I know it's the morning, so this is to get rid of the morning breath for you guys. Um, and so we also have chocolate somewhere. Yeah, so they will go with the milk first, and then they'll Okay. So, um, I'm sure you guys have all eaten mint before. Feel free to eat it. Chew it. Good. So, uh, um, yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> You've never eaten mint leaves before? No. Have you ever had mint tea? Yeah. It's like that, but not dry. So what kind of sensations do you feel when you eat things? <laughs> no one can describe it. You've all had mints before. How does it feel? What's that? You can yell it out. It doesn't taste good. It doesn't taste good? No. Okay. Yeah, a lot of plants have some bitter stuff. That also helps them prevent, prevent it from being eaten. 
But so, so we're talking about temperature I, perception. I don't know. <laughs> Wait, are we supposed to swallow this or no? Yeah, you can. Oh. It's I wasn't going to do it. Real fun. It's probably easiest to swallow. Yeah, you're coming for yourself. I wasn't going to do it. Yes, there's a trash can in that. No, it's, it's fine. It's perfectly, perfectly fine for you. What kind, so we're talking about temperature perception now. What, what te type of temperature sensations do you feel when you eat It's cool. It's cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. So now we also have, on the, the other end of the spectrum, we've got um, some chocolate that has chili pepper in it, if anyone's brave enough to eat that. It's pretty, it's pretty mild. It's, it's, mild. it's very mild. We made the mistake of, of once brewing some that was a little bit spicier, and some people couldn't handle it. It's pretty mild. It's pretty mild. It's cool. All right, last well, little one. Wait, I have the bigger piece of it. Okay. It's mild. You can, you can smell that. All right. You can smell <laughs> It's, it's, it's like really if Elena can eat it, you guys yeah. can eat it. It's like bark chocolate right now. Yeah, it's not it's not so strong. Yeah, it's not. Whoa. We have made a mistake of bringing them too too spicy food before. So when you eat, you eat mint, you feel cold. When you eat chili chocolate, how do you feel? Looks even better. <laughs> not, not, not cold. Not cold. Yeah. Do so you feel hot, right? You know, if this was really spicy, you feel. Yeah, it's very spicy. Yeah, no. I don't think I split it with it, though. <laughs> but, uh, so if you, if you eat chili peppers, you feel hot, right? And so it turns out how that works is um, the fact so, so chili peppers contain a molecule called capsaicin. Um, and capsaicin activates literally the same neurons that are activated by uh, painful heat. And so the way you can see it at the molecular level is the, through ion channels. So at the cell membrane, you have these ion channels that are just essentially pores in the membrane, just holes in the membrane that can be regulated open or closed. And so when a certain, when trip D1, uh, the, the warm sensitive ion channel becomes activated by heat, it opens up, allows positive charge to flow into the cell. That uh, charge flow can initiate an action potential, send that signal to the brain, and you perceive uh, a, a temperature is hot. But capsaicin can also activate the exact same ion channel and activate those exact same neurons. And so it tricks your body into thinking it's experiencing something warm even though what you're eating is actually room temperature. And so similarly, mint has a compound called menthol in it and menthol activates uh, a, a, a pleasantly, a, a an ion channel that's activated by pleasantly cool temperatures. And so by activating trip M8, you can, your body gets tricked into thinking uh, that you're eating something cool instead of just a room temperature leaf. So um, with that, I'll stop talking and we can split up into some groups and study a few different things. So we have a few different activities today. Uh, one group will be going to Slav's lab to tour the lab and see what goes on in a, a, a research lab. Um, we have another experiment where uh, Evan will, or someone in the back will be doing temperature adaptation to explore how your body adapts to temperature and other sensory um, stimuli. And then third, we'll have a, a setup over here um, demonstrating some of the, the ways in which we study temperature perception in the lab, how we've been able to uh, characterize these various temperature sensitive ion channels and, and understand how the, the body senses temperature. So I guess there's 10 of you, right? So maybe three, three and four. 